Welcome to part three of our study on the lunar Sabbath. We're looking at historical evidence. Before we get started, I'd like to go to the Lord in prayer. So if you'll bow your heads with me or kneel. Our dear Father in heaven, we come to you and we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you for this opportunity to look into history and see what your what is said there so that we can understand more clearly what is truth. And we recognize that any of this historical evidence is just secondary to your word. And we thank you for the time you've already spent with us and shown us in your word what you have to say on this subject of the Lunar Sabbath. And now we pray for guidance again as we look into history. Please help us to understand and discern right from wrong and truth from error. And we ask, Father, that you pour out your Spirit upon each one of us. And especially I ask that you pour it out upon me so that the words spoken would not be mine but yours. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we get started, I would like to point out on historical evidence the key to the whole issue of history is not whether the calendars, any calendars were changed prior to the Messiah's time, prior to Christ's time. Any changes that happened before that are really insignificant because whatever happened from Christ's time to our day is what counts because at Christ's time we know that they were keeping the right calendar, the right Sabbath, and so whatever happened from there on is what we need to look at. Also, any um, argument or documentation that deals with the change to the Gregorian calendar, the Julian calendar, or any pagan calendars has nothing to do with the subject that we're looking at because the Jews never kept the pagan calendars. The Jews had their own calendar that went by the moon. Even to this day, they keep a separate calendar from most people in the world because they have the, um, the lunar calendar that's based on the moon. And they, it's true they also go by the Gregorian calendar that most of the world uses today, but they've always had their lunar calendar. They've always based their feasts on the moon. And that's why it changes. If you notice on the Gregorian calendar, on the calendar we use today, the, the feasts of the Jews always switch dates. They're never on the same date in the Gregorian calendar because they're using their own calendar. And they always have. So this is really the issue is what has happened to the Jewish calendar. That is the issue that has to, we have to be looking at. Um, I would like to notice one change to the Gregorian calendar that took place. It took place in 1582. And I'd like to go ahead and look at this. The calendar and from 15, October 1582, there was a change where 10 days were taken out of the calendar and it was um, switched. But I'd like to point out that, read from the Wikipedia Encyclopedia, it says the last day of the Julian calendar was Thursday, 4th of October, 1582, and this was followed by the first day of the Gregorian calendar, Friday, 15th of October, 1582. The cycle of the weekdays was not affected. So you notice that the weekly cycle, the order of the days, when, uh, what day the Sabbath was, and so on, was not affected whatsoever by the Gregorian calendar change. So any change to the calendar, if it did not affect the order of the week, is insignificant. And if it did not affect the Jewish calendar, it's insignificant. The only changes that matter is what happened to the Jewish calendar. Now, there, there, recently I've been reading a lot of information on history, historical evidence, and most of it revolves around what happened to the Julian calendar, or what happened to the Gregorian calendar, or what Constantine did to the... Um, Gregor or the Julian calendar at his time. But all of this information was insignificant. I, as I was reading these things, I kept thinking, show me something that matters. You know, it want, show me something that affects the day in which the Jews kept the Sabbath. That's what's really important. And I came across this quote from in one of these papers from the Schaeff Herzog Encyclopedia, and it really stunned me because I thought here was definitely some evidence that the Jews changed their calendar. And this is the quote, the first quote that I read from the Schaeff Herzog Encyclopedia, and it says, The association of Sabbath rest with the account of creation must have been very ancient among the Hebrews, and it is noteworthy 
that no other Semitic peoples, even the Babylonians, have any tradition of creation in six days. It would appear that the primitive Semites had four chief moon days, probably the first, eighth, fifteenth, and twenty-second of each month, called Sabbaths, from the fact that there was a tendency to end work before them so that they might be celebrated joyfully. Among the Babylonians, these seventh days, through astrological conceptions, became ill-omened. While the Sabbath in the middle of the month was made a day of propitiation, and its name was construed as meaning the day for ending the wrath of the gods. The Israelites, on the other hand, made the Sabbaths the feasts of a living and holy God. The work of man became symbolic of the work of God, and human rest of divine rest, so that the Sabbaths became preeminently days of rest. Since, moreover, the lunar month had twenty-nine or thirty days, the normal lapse of time between Sabbaths was six days, although sometimes seven or eight, and six working days were accordingly assigned to the creation, which was to furnish a prototype for human life. The connection of the Sabbath with lunar phases, however, was discarded by the Israelites, who did not worship the moon, and the weeks were accordingly divorced from the days of the months and were made to follow in succession throughout the year. A more regular correspondence with the week of creation being thus secured, the first lunar day, however, or the day of the new moon, retained, although no longer called Sabbath, somewhat of its sabbatical character, so that in the Old Testament it frequently appears as a pendant of the Sabbath. Now that's taken from the new Shaf Herzog Religious Encyclopedia article, The Sabbath, edited by Samuel Macaulay, 1912, volume 10, pages 135 and 136. Now, when I read this, I was really um, troubled because I thought here is, now we have some evidence showing that the Sabbath was changed, the Jewish Sabbath was changed. But there's one thing that was left out. I don't know if you noticed when we were reading that, the yellow portion that said that the Sabbath was, or sorry, the Jews did not worship the moon. That part of the quote was deleted in the, when it was quoted to support the lunar Sabbath. That part of the quote showing that the, the reason the Jews did not follow the moon is because they didn't worship the moon. That part was deleted and replaced with a dot, 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 which left out that um, clue that might show you that, hey, there's something a little bit fishy about this statement, and we might need to check it out a little further. So when I, when I found this, I, was, I, was, I found it quite interesting. But I'd like to look at the quote, because I wasn't comfortable with this. I wanted to check it out for myself. So I went to the Schaef Herzog Encyclopedia, and it's taken from pages 134 to 136 of the article on the Sabbath. And here... Uh, before you is page 134, and here's 135, and then page 136. Now notice the highlighted section is where the quote was taken. And I'd like to look at page 135 again. See at the bottom of this page, the yellow portion is what was quoted, but now up above is not quoted. The part, especially in the green here, I would like to look at is on page 135 in the same article on the Sabbath. Notice what it says here. He says, In none of these passages is there the slightest implication that the Sabbath was connected in any way with the moon. The author then speaks about opinions and hypotheses, stating that these were things that there is no evidence, for which there is no evidence. And he states emphatically that the Hebrew Sabbath was not connected with the full moon. So we found this right in the very same article that the Hebrew Sabbath was not in any way connected with the moon. And then he says, the assumption that the Hebrews borrowed the Sabbath from the Babylonians lacks all foundation. And that's from the very same article, the Schaefer's Encyclopedia on the Sabbath. Now, so what I found from this is you can't really trust what you're seeing unless you check it out for yourself. And when I checked this out, I found that the article that was being used to, to prove lunar Sabbath actually proves the opposite. And this was just one of the theories that was promoted is that the Jews adopted the Sabbath from the Babylonians who, who kept their weeks according to the moon. And I found this was just 
bogus. It's not what the article was saying at all, and that's what the article was saying, is this is not factual. It la lacks all foundation, and there was no connection with the Jewish Sabbath to the moon. So, so this was one quote that I found used to promote uh, lunar Sabbaths from history. And then there was another one that came from the Jewish Encyclopedia. And this really got me uh, questioning because the Jews ought to know where the Sabbath came from. And they ought to be able to speak authoritatively on this subject. So I'd like to read this next quote from the Jewish Encyclopedia. And it says, The idea of the week as a subdivision of the month seems to have arisen in Babylonia where each lunar month was divided into four parts, corresponding to the four phases of the moon. The first week of each month began with the new moon, so that as the lunar month was one or two days more than four periods of seven days, these additional days were not reckoned at all. Every seventh day, Sabbatum, was regarded as an unlucky day. This method of reckoning time spread westward through Syria and Palestine and was adopted by the Israelites probably after the s they settled in Palestine. With the development of the importance of the Sabbath as a day of consecration and the emphasis laid upon the significant number seven, the week became more and more divorced from its lunar connection. That's from the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia, Volume 10, 1943, Article Week, page 482. So this, again, caused me to wonder. Now, this, the Jews themselves are telling me that the, moon, the Sabbath used to be connected with the moon and that it became divorced from its lunar connection. But there was one thing in that article, in that quote, that caused me to wonder, caused me to be puzzled, because right in that quote, it said that We'll look back at this quote right at the beginning. It says, the idea of the week as a subdivision of the month. Um, going on there, it says that they, that the idea of the week seems to have arisen in Babylonia. Well, automatically, we know there's something wrong here because the, the week came from creation. Back when God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. That's where the week came from. But here, this encyclopedia said that it came from Babylonia. So th this, th there's really a problem here. In fact, it says that the Jews adopted it from, I'm sorry, the Jews adopted it probably after they settled in Palestine. They adopted this from the Babylonians. Now, does this make sense? That the Jews would have adopted the Sabbath from the pagans? That's not where they got it. We know that's not true. We know that the Jews got the Sabbath from God way back in creation. So here the Jews, this Jewish encyclopedia is telling me something that I know is not true. We know that the Jews did not adopt the Sabbath from the pagans. So how can I trust when he says that it, uh, originally it was connected with the moon? If he's, he, it's outright lying right at the beginning, how can I trust what's said next? So this caused me to wonder, and it made me... Um, check things out a little more detailed. I found another quote. This is also from the Jewish Encyclopedia. And this says, The new moon is still, and the Sabbath originally was, dependent upon the lunar cycle. So this is another thing that really got me concerned or got me interested. But what I found, the article author was Max Joseph. And I found in another article, he said that the origin of the Sabbath the origin of the Sabbath is uncertain. Um, let me quote exactly from this. He says, the origin of the Sabbath is obscure. So that's Max Joseph, the same author that says it came from the moon. He says, I don't really know where it came from. And this is very similar to another quote in the Jewish Encyclopedia that says, the origin of the Sabbath, as well as the true meaning of the name, is uncertain. Now that's strange coming from the Jews. They ought to know where the Sabbath came from. It should be certain. It's right in the Bible. It tells you where the Sabbath came from. And then it says, It was probably originally connected in some manner with the cult of the moon. Now notice this word probably. That should throw a, a question mark up in your mind, a red flag. Probably. They don't even know what they're talking about here. But they say it probably was connected originally with the moon. Well, we know where the Sabbath originally came from. It came from God in creation in Genesis 1. 
And it goes on, as indeed is suggested by the frequent mention of the Sabbath and new moon festivals in the same sentence. The Sabbath depending in Israel's nomadic period upon the observation of the phases of the moon. It could not, according to this view, be fixed a fixed day. When the Israelites settled in the land and became farmers, their new life would have made it desirable that the Sabbath should come at regular intervals and the desired change would have been made all the more easily as they had abandoned the r lunar religion. That's the, the coming from the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia article is the Sabbath. So here it says again that the, the Jews adopted this uh, ritual of seven day week from the pagans. When they were worshiping the moon, they were keeping the Sabbath according to the moon. But since they rejected worshiping the moon, that's when they um, divorced it from the lunar connection. But how could I trust anything this Jewish encyclopedia is saying when I it's blatantly uh, lying in certain areas and it says that they don't even know where the Sabbath came from? Well, I, I seem to find clearly in the Bible that the Sabbath came from Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, when God created the world. So, so far these were the strongest statements that I found to prove that the Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath, originally was connected to the moon, and I found both of these quotes were bogus, both the from the Schaefer-Zog Encyclopedia and the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia. So it, it really caused me to question, when I see a quote from history, I want to check this out, because I can't really just take what is said at face value without knowing for myself if this is true, reading the context, checking everything out for myself. And I, I pray that you will do the same thing. I'd like to look at some more quotes that are very interesting. I found a quote in the Anchor Bible Dictionary that is very interesting. It says, Beginning in 1905, J. Meinhold argued that the Old Testament Sabbath was originally a monthly full moon day and as such was borrowed by Israel from ancient Babylon. His hypothesis has found sporadic support. And you notice even in Jewish Encyclopedia, it has found support. But then he says, There is no compelling evidence in the Old Testament for an alleged transfer from a pre-exilic monthly Sabbath to an exilic or post-exilic weekly Sabbath. That's the Anchor Bible Dictionary, article, Bible Dictionary, Article the Sabbath. So, here we find that this man, J. Meinhold, in 1905, came up with this theory, this hypothesis, about the Sabbath originating from the moon, and then... Others have taken up this idea and have written different articles. It's in the Jewish Encyclopedia. The Schaefer-Zog Encyclopedia mentioned it. So we found there, but there is no support for this. It's just a hypothesis that this man, J. Meinhold, came up with, and now people are following it as if it were fact. And because they find it in an encyclopedia, they think it must be true. But just check it out for yourself. Now let's look at another... Um, Quote, this comes from the New Encyclopedia Britannica, article The Week. And it says, a, The week is a period of seven days, a unit of time artificially devised with no astronomical basis. By the first century BC, the Jewish seven-day week seems to have been adopted throughout the Roman world, and this influenced Christendom. Now notice here it says that by the first century BC, that's before Christ, the Jewish seven-day week had been adopted throughout the Roman world. So, the, the change from a seven-day week or a, a lunar week to a continual seven-day cycle, there's no record of any change. There's no record in history that this change has ever taken place. And there has been, it's true there was a change from in the Roman calendar, they used to have an eight-day week, and I'd like to um, look at that in just a moment. But I, first of all, I want to read from about a visionary. This is in the Jewish calendars, found on crystallinks.com. On the Jewish calendars, it says, A visionary, probably writing in the Persian or early Hellenistic age, under the name of the Predeluvian Enoch, suggested the religious calendar of 364 days, or 52 weeks, based on the week in which all festivals always fall on the same weekday. His day was later taken up by the Qumram community. 
Now notice this, that it says that this person writing under the pre-diluvian name Enoch, he was writing in the Persian or early Hellenistic age. Now that's around 300 BC and he proposed the 364 day calendar which is divisible by seven so that all of the feasts would come on the same day of the month the same day of the week I'm sorry so this shows that the Jews did not keep the feasts in an order that they would come on the same day of the week every year but with a lunar calendar that's uh, a lunar Sabbath I should say that is what would happen? The feast would always fall on the same day of the week because there's a specific date given, the 15th of the first month, the 15th of the seventh month. Those days would always be a Sabbath if the lunar Sabbath were correct. But this pre-diluvian uh, man writing uh, with the pre-diluvian name Enoch was suggesting that they should have a calendar of 364 days that would cause the feasts to line up with the week so they'd always fall on the same day of the week. Now that would be completely disconnected from the moon and and so it would it would definitely not jive with uh, what the Bible says about the new moons and the feast coming on the 15th of the month uh, from the new moon and so on. That wouldn't happen with this Enoch calendar. I'd like to look at the Enoch calendar. Here's an actual uh, picture of how the Enoch calendar worked. They were he was trying to put 30 days in every month. There's always 30 days and then there was an extra day in each quarter. So there were four extra days throughout the year and what that would do is it would throw it off um, according to the moon. But it would keep it in line with the week so that the, the festivals would always happen on the same day of the week. The fact that this person wrote and tried to promote this 300 years before Christ and then the Qumran community took up this calendar and started keeping this calendar and we find that in the Dead Sea Scrolls. This proves that the Jews generally were not keeping this calendar. They were not keeping a calendar that coincided the week with the dates of the month or the festivals landing on the same day of the week. They varied. They would land on any day of the week. Okay, I'd like to read a quote now from, um, this is from a website called crystallinks.com, the Jewish calendar. And it says here, the new year begins on Tishri 1, which may be the day of the Molad of Tishri, but is often delayed by one or two days for various reasons. Thus, in order to prevent the Day of Atonement, Tishri 10, from falling on a Friday or a Sunday, and the seventh day of Tabernacles, Tishri 21, from falling on a Saturday, the new year must avoid commencing on Sundays, Wednesdays, or Fridays. Again, if the Molad of Tishri occurs at noon or later, the new year is delayed by one or, if this would cause it to fall as above, two days. So I want you to notice that, that the Jews we know they were jealously guarding the Sabbath. They thought very highly of the Sabbath. And here they determined the beginning of their year based on the Sabbath. If, the, if it would conflict with their Sabbath, they would change the day the, the year began based on this. And this is the way it's still calculated today. The Jews start their uh, years so that the Day of Atonement would never fall on a Friday or a Sunday. It could fall on Sabbath, but never on a Friday or a Sunday because that would make a two-day uh, Sabbath, because the Day of Atonement was a Sabbath day, a annual Sabbath. Actually, the only annual Sabbath there was, the only annual Shabbat, was on the tenth day of the of the seventh month, and so they were trying to avoid that Shabbat day for two Shabbat days to happen at, in a row. And it's interesting too that they only are concerned about that Shabbat day of the Day of Atonement. There's no other Shabbat day or Shabbaton day that they're concerned about. In fact. In, um, in the Jewish calendar, the 15th day of the month, of the first month, which is a Shabbaton day, it can fall on Friday or Sunday. It, they weren't concerned about that. That's fine. Because that's not a Shabbat day. They were allowed to do work there, just not servile work. So to have uh, a Shabbaton day followed by a Shabbat day was never a problem. It's still not a problem. They allow that to happen. But they would never allow two Shabbat days to fall in at this and one day after the other so that's just interesting that they they base their year on the Sabbath rather than the other way around they don't change the Sabbath to fit their year now 
I would like to re read another quote from this is comes from the Wikipedia and it says that there were two major forms of the calendar have been used before the destruction of the second temple in 70 CE the start of each month was based on the observation of the new crescent witnesses would be required to testify that they had seen the new crescent which would signify the start of the new month between 70 and 1178 CE, a rule-based system was adopted. The principles were fully described by Maimonides in 1178 CE. That's from the Wiki, Wikipedia Encyclopedia, the Hebrew calendar. So we find that uh, there was a change. I'd like to read another quote. There's a change in the way they reckon their months. Here's another quote. It says, The period between 70 and 1178 was a transition period between the two forms with the gradual adoption of more and more of the rules characteristic of the modern form. Except for the modern year number, the modern rules reached their final form before 820 or 921, with some uncertainty regarding when. The modern Hebrew calendar cannot be used to calculate biblical dates because new moon dates may be in error by up to four days and months may be in error by up to four months. The latter accounts for the irregular intercalation, adding of extra months. That was performed in three successive years in the early second century according to the Talmud. So you notice there it says that when those the two forms of the calendars are adopted the calendar that the Jews keep today is different they don't reckon the new moon the same as they used to before the destruction of Jerusalem they counted the calendar by the new visible crescent that was the new moon day and then their months started from there and their feasts were all based upon the that calculation but now today they keep it by um, by the vi invisible new moon when th when there is no visible crescent and they keep it by calculations rather than by observation so there was a change and as this quote pointed out you cannot um, accurately determine biblical dates based on the the current Jewish calendar because they didn't calculate the dates back then the same way they calculated by the visible crescent and so if you use today's reckoning to calculate those dates back before 70 AD you can be off by up to four, day, four days, one way or the other, and you can be off by four months. So it's a very unstable way of calculating it because the visible crescent could happen at different times. Now, I'd like to read another quote, and this comes from crystallinks.com, the Jewish calendar. And here it says, once decided, the beginning of each Hebrew month was first announced to other communities by signal fires lit on mountaintops. But after the Samaritans and Bethusians began to light false fires, a shaliak was sent. The inability of the shaliak to reach communities outside Israel within one day led outlying communities to celebrate scriptural festivals for two days rather than for one, observing the second feast day of the Jewish diaspora because of uncertainty whether the previous month was 29 or 30 days. So notice what happened that the people who were relying on observation of the moon they, they didn't understand whether the month was 29 or 30 days, so they would keep festivals two days in a row because it was uncertain by just observation whether the day started on one day or ne the next day. They were relying upon the Jews, Jewish leaders to tell them when the, the new month started. So the observation method was not very reliable. They were uncertain when the, moon really, when the month really started just based on what they could see. So they had to to rely on the Jews to tell them when it started. Now, there was a eight-day week used by the Romans. Constantine uh, made a change from the eight-day week to the seven-day week. The seven-day week became official in 325 AD. And I'd like to look at the Roman calendar with the eight-day week. This is the eight-day Roman calendar. And you'll notice on the left there are alphabet a b c d e f g h and you there that is eight h is the eighth day 
and then it go, starts over A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and it continues that way. That was the eight-day Roman market uh, day calendar. Every red letter was a market day, and there was eight days in this calendar. This definitely did not coincide with the seven-day cycle that the Jews had. But what's interesting is that there was also a seven-day calendar in use as well, before, long before Constantine's time. Let's, let's look at how this uh, Roman calendar was calculated. Notice, notice what it says here. The, the Nunan day, or this is the counters of the day, were si signified by those, that first letter, and it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. So there were eight days there. You can take time to look at that a little bit later. So, I would like to notice something here. In 1795, in 1795, that there was found marble fragments of what is known as the Sabine calendar, Fasti Sabini. In a place in central Italy, these portions represent the months of September and October in the Julian calendar. The experts in this type of archaeological finds have declared them to belong to the reign of Augustus Caesar and that they were in use between 19 BC and 14 AD. So notice this is a Roman calendar, this Sabine calendar that was found in 1795. It was in use from 19 BC to 14 AD, which covered the time when Christ was born. So when Christ was here, this calendar, the Sabine calendar, was in use for sure. And notice this. This is a picture of the seven-day Sabine calendar and right alongside the eight-day Roman calendar, market day calendar. They used them at the same time. And this, this I'm going to quote from Famous First in Ancient Greek and Roman World by David Matz, page 116. It says that an inscription CIL 1220 dated between 19 BC and 14 AD preserving the remains of a Sabine calendar is the earliest known public record of a seven-day week. The calendar as reproduced by Bowsden 62 reads as follows and you notice this calendar it has on the left side you have E F G and then A B C D E F and then right beside it is the Roman eight-day week, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, A. So you notice that the Sabine calendar, the seven-day week, did not perfectly coincide with the eight-day week. It couldn't. But it shows that they were used both at the same time. The eight-day week and the seven-day week were both used by the Romans when Christ was here and prior to that as well. Okay, now I'd like to read a quote. It says, The modern seven-day week came into use during the early imperial period, after the Julian calendar came into effect, apparently stimulated by immigration from the Roman East. For a while, it coexisted alongside the old eight-day Nundinal cycle, and fasti are known which show both cycles. It was finally given official status by Constantine in 321 AD. That's from the ancient Roman calendars, crystallinks.com, Roman calendars. So we find that there were two calendars in use at the same time. The seven-day week and the eight-day week were used at the same time, and finally the seven-day week gained ascendancy, and Constantine in 320 AD chose the seven-day week as opposed to the eight-day week, and that was the end of the eight-day week cycle in Romanism. However, that did not affect the seven-day cycle. The seven-day cycle was still used continuously prior to that. And we know the Jews had a seven-day cycle long before that. Now, I want to read from another quote. This is called The Days of the Week. It says, At first, the Romans used the ancient Etruscan market week, which consisted of a period of eight days, called the Nundinae, the nine days, remember the Romans counted inclusively, every eighth day was a market day. The seven day or astrological or planetary, there were seven visible planets. Week originated in Persia and by the end of the first century CE was in wide use through the Mediterranean. The first 
public evidence of the seven-day week in Rome appears in a Sabine calendar from between 19 BC and 14 CE. Augustus recognized the seven-day week, but the non-denial calendar continued to be used alongside it. Only in 321 CE did seven days become the official length of the week. That's taken from the introduction of the Roman way of telling time, Wheaton College. It was a lesson handout, and you can find that online. So this tells us that the Rom Romans used both a seven-day week and an eight-day week at the same time. Now this seven-day week that they used it was a planetary week, and that was a week that was um, named after the planets. That's even today we have those names. We have Sunday after the sun, Monday after the moon, Tuesday is after, let's see, that is after named after Mars, and then Wednesday is named after um, Venus, or I'm sorry, Mercury. Well, well, we'll just see this in just a second. Let's look at this calendar, how the planets coincided with the days of the week. You notice the order of planets, and then this dial here, uh, this star here, was used to show how the, um, the week was calculated. The first day of the pagan planetary week was Saturday, Saturn Day. The second day was Sunday. The third day was Moon Day, named after Jupiter. The fourth day was Mars Day. The fifth day was Mercury's Day. The sixth day was Jupiter. The seventh day was Venus, and so on. The first day of the pagan calendar was Saturn. That's true. That's a fact. That was the first day of the week to the pagans. Not to the Jews, but to the pagans, it was the first day of the week. And also, I would like to notice how these days, the, the pagans calculated the even the hours of the day were ruled by each of these planetary gods, supposed that these pagan gods. And this just shows that how the hours of the day um, were coincide with these different planets. And this pagan planetary week never changed order. It was always the same. Still to this day, it's the same as it was way back then. And they, they never added an eighth day. They never rearranged the order. This has always been the way the pagan calendar has, has been, well, from way back in history. But this was the seven-day planetary week that was adopted by Rome and was even used during Christ's time when he was here by the Romans and the pagans. Okay, now I would like to I would like to go to another quote. This is commenting on how Pompey destroyed Jerusalem, captured Jerusalem in 63 BC, long before Christ time. 63 BC, Pompey um, overtook R Jerusalem, and this is a quote. It's this is from Dio Cassius. Who, who lived from 150 to 235 AD. He says, If they, the Jews, had continued defending it, the temple, on all days alike, he, Pompey, could not have got possession of it. As it was, they made an exception of what are called the days of Saturn, and by doing no work at all on those days, afforded the Romans an opportunity in this interval to batter down the wall. The latter, on learning of this superstitious awe of theirs, made no serious attempts the rest of the time, but on those days, when they came around in succession, assaulted most vigorously. Thus the defenders were captured on the day of Saturn without making any defense, and all the wealth was plundered. The kingdom was given to Hyrcanus and Aristobulus, who was carried away. That's Dio Cassius, Roman History, Book 37, Chapter 16. So you can check this out for yourself. It says that Jerusalem was overtaken by Pompey on the day of Saturn. And it says it came around in succession. Every seven days was the day of Saturn, according to the pagans. That's what they called this day, the day of Saturn. And this was in 63 BC when Pompey was destroyed. They had this seven-day weekly cycle because they called it the day of Saturn. And it came around in a succession of seven days. Here's another quote. This says, 
This is coming from Josephus. Now this is a Jewish historian, and he says, Nor had the Romans succeeded in their endeavors, had not Pompey taken notice of the seventh days, on which the Jews abstained from all sorts of work, on a religious account. Now what day do the Jews abstain from religious work on the seventh day? It's the Sabbath. And Dio Cassius calls it the day of Saturn, and here Josephus calls this the Sabbath. On a it says, They raised his bank, but restrained his soldiers from fighting on those days, for the Jews only acted defensively on the Sabbath days. That comes from Josephus, Wars of the Jews, Book 1, Chapter 7, Section 3. So we find that Dio Cassius calls the day Saturn in 63 BC. It was the day of Saturn. Josephus calls it the day the Sabbath day. So we find that the Sabbath day and the day of Saturn, the pagan day of Saturn, are the same day. They coincide. And this isn't the only time we find this connection. Let's look at another quote now. It says, They, the Jews, are distinguished from the rest of mankind in practically every detail of life, and especially by the fact that they do not honor any of the usual gods. Those pagan planetary gods, they did not honor them. But they show extreme reverence for one particular divinity. They never had any statue of him, even in Jerusalem itself. But believing him to be unnameable and invisible, they worship him in the most extravagant fashion on earth. They built to him a temple that was extremely large and beautiful, and likewise dedicated to him the day called the Day of Saturn, on which... Among many other most peculiar observances, they undertake no serious occupation. And that's Dio Cassius, Roman History, Book 37, Chapter 17. So here we find that secular Jewish or Roman historians say that the days the Jews honored as the Sabbath was called the day of Saturn. That's the, um, the same day today. It's still called Saturn Day or Saturday. Saturday and the Jewish Sabbath are the same day of the week. They fall on the same, at the same time. And th you can see that this day of Saturn was used back in 63 BC when Pompey overtook Jerusalem, long before Christ's time. So when Christ was here, the weekly cycle, the Jews were keeping Saturday when Jesus was here. That's according to history, very clearly. Now, I'd like to read from another quote. This comes from Josephus, and he says, Had it not been for our practice from the days of our forefathers to rest on the seventh day, this bank, thrown up by Pompey, could never have been perfected by reason of the opposition the Jews would have made. For though our law gives us leave then to defend ourselves against those that begin to fight us and assault us, yet does it not permit us to meddle with our enemies while they do anything else? Which thing, when the Romans understood... On those days, which we call Sabbaths, they threw nothing at the Jews, nor came to any pitched battle with them, but raised up their earthen banks, and brought their engines into such forwardness, that they might do ex execution the next day. So here it says that the day that um, the Romans were able to fortify themselves was on the day of Saturn. Or on the Sabbath day is what Josephus says. Dio Cassius says it was on the day of Saturn. Now I'd like to read from Strabo. He was another historian, and he was a Greek geographer, actually. He was born around 63 B.C. So this is before Christ's time, and here he's talking about Pompey again. He says, Pompey seized the city, it is said, after watching for the day of fasting when the Judeans were abstaining from all work. He filled up the trench and threw ladders across it. So there, again, we have many evidence, many witnesses telling us that the Jew, that Pompey overtook Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, which was coincided with the day of Saturn, Saturn day. That was the day that Pompey overtook Jerusalem. Now, notice this is another quote from Herod, Herod Agrippa. Now, this is the same Herod that's mentioned in Acts 25 and 26. It says, when urging the Jew, Jewish leaders not to rebel against the Roman power in 66 AD, he, this is referring to the capture of Jerusalem, or he referred to the capture of Jerusalem by Pompey in 63 BC, saying, if you do observe the custom of the Sabbath days, you will easily be taken, as were your forefathers by Pompey, 
who was the busiest in his siege on those days on which the besieged rested. That's Josephus, Wars of the Jews, Book 2, Chapter 16. So check all of these things out for yourself. This, this is what his history tells us, that the Saturn day and the Sabbath day coincided. Not that those who are keeping the Sabbath day are worshiping in any way or giving honor to Saturn, as one of these Jewish histori or Roman historians pointed out. They didn't worship at all. These Jews didn't worship at all the regular gods, the Saturn. They didn't show any reverence to Saturn. Instead, they honors, honored the God of heaven, whom they said was unnamed, but they honored him on a day, the Sabbath day, which coincided with the day of Saturn. I'd like to read another quote. This says, This officer conquered in battle Antigonus, who had put to death the Roman guards that were with him and reduced him by siege when he took refuge in Jerusalem. The Jews indeed had done much injury to the Romans, for the race is very bitter when aroused to anger, but they suffered far more themselves. The first of them to be captured were those who were fighting for the precinct of their god, and then the rest on the, on the day even then called the day of Saturn. And so excessive were they in their devotion to religion that the, fir that the first set of prisoners, those who had been captured along with the temple, obtained leave from Sosius when the day of Saturn came around again and went up into the temple and there performed all the customary rites together with the rest of the people. So here it says that even then the day was called Saturn. That is the day, the Sabbath day, when they, the Jews were not fighting offensively and it gave those their enemies extra advantage over them during those times. And so we find that the sat day of Saturn and the day of Sabbath coincided. Now I'd like to read another quote. This is from another historian, Frontinus. And he says, The divine Augustus Vespasian attacked the Jews on the day of Saturn, on which it is forbidden for them to do anything serious, and prevailed. That's Frontinus, uh, The Stratagems, Book 2, Chapter 1, Section 17. So here we have many quotes. We have Dio Cassius, we have um, Frontinus, we have Strabo, we have uh, Agrippa. All of these testifying that the, the Jewish Sabbath was the same day as the pagan day of Saturn. I'd like to read again from Dio Cassius. He says, Thus was Jerusalem destroyed on the very day of Saturn, the day which even now the Jews reverence most. From that time forth it was ordered that the Jews who continued to observe their ancestral customs should pay an annual tribute of two denarii to Jupiter Capitolinus. That comes from Dio Cassius, Roman History, Book 65, Chapter 7. So there it says, Jerusalem was destroyed on the very day of Saturn. And that happened both in 63 BC and in 70 AD. They attacked on the day of Saturn, which is the Jewish Sabbath day. Now notice that the date of the fall of Jerusalem was Saturday, September 8th, 70 AD according to several authorities. That's one is the New International Encyclopedia, volume 22, page 309, article Titus. So September 8th, Saturday, September 8th, 70 AD was the day that Jerusalem was captured. It was on a Sabbath day. And it was also Saturn day. Many hi historians will tell you that's the day that it was. I'd like to read another quote. There's so many quotes on this subject, so much evidence. Now here's another one. This is Dio Cass er, This comes from Hutton Webster, Rest Days, A Study in Early Law and Morality, and it's page 244 to 245. Dio Cassius also speaks of the Jews having dedicated to their God the day called the Day of Saturn, on which, among many other most peculiar actions, they undertake no serious occupation. Tacitus who is a Roman historian of the 1st and early 2nd century, he thinks that the Jewish Sabbath may be an observance in honor of Saturn. So Tacitus, who was an early historian, he thought that perhaps the Jews were honoring Saturn because they were keeping the day of Saturn as the Sabbath. 
They weren't honoring Saturn. They weren't honoring anybody but the true God on the Sabbath by honor, by setting apart that day. But it just so happened it coincided with Saturn. So this pagan historian thought that maybe they were honoring Saturn. But in reality, they were honoring the God of heaven by that day. I'd like to read another quote. This comes from Clement of Alexandria. This is an early um, church fathers quote. Church fathers. Clement of Alexandria it says he... He knows also the en enigmas of the fasting of those days, I mean the fourth and the preparation. So the fourth day and the preparation day, it says, For the one has its name from Hermes, Mercury, and the other from Aphrodite, Venus. He fasts in his life in respect to the, of covetousness and voluptuousness from which all the vices grow. That's Clement of Alexandria, who lived A.D. 153 to 217, Miscellaneous, Book 7, Chapter 12. And that's in the Anti-Nicene Fathers, Volume 2, page 544. So here we find that Clement of Alexandria claimed that the days of the week, the Jewish days of the week, the fourth day and the preparation day, coincided with the planetary week of the pagans. It was exactly the same. So it was a continual, unbroken seven-day cycle. And this was long before Constantine made a change in 321 where he officially adopted the seven-day week over the eight-day week. Long before that, there was a seven-day week that was used very commonly among the Romans from dating from before Christ was here, from 63 BC at least. If not earlier, they were keeping a seven-day weekly cycle. And there's much evidence of this. Now I'd like to read another quote, and this comes from Philo. He says, The fourth commandment has reference to the sacred seventh day, that it may be passed in a second and holy manner. Now some states keep the holy festival only once in the month, counting from the new moon, as a day sacred to the Almighty. But the nation of the Jews keeps every seventh day regularly after each interval of six days. And there is an account of events recorded in the history of the creation of the world comprising a sufficient relation of the cause of this ordinance. For the sacred historian says that the world was created in six days and that the seventh day God desisted from his works and began to contemplate what he had so beautifully created. That's Philo G Judaeus, the Decalogue, number 20, page 526. So notice here, it says that some states keep the holy festivals only once in the month, counting from the new moon. But he says, the nation of the Jews keeps every seventh day after each interval of six days. So there he's showing the contrast of those who, who honor days according to the moon and the Jews. The Jews did not keep the Sabbath according to the moon. That's what Philo is telling us here. Now I'd like to read another quote. This comes from Philo again. It says, But after this continued and uninterrupted festival, which thus lasts through all time, there is another celebrated, namely, that of the sacred seventh day, after each recurring interval of six days, proclaiming a day of freedom to them also after every space of six days. That's Philo Judaeus, the special laws, um, number two, 25, or 15, section 56. So just check these things out for yourself. Find out what, what the hist historians are really telling us. And Philo says, that the Jews kept their week, their Sabbath, at each recurring interval, after each recurring interval of six days. They never had an interval of seven or eight days like the Lunar Sabbath argument would uh, propose. Now I'd like to look at the laws of postponements. These are very interesting. The laws of postponements, there were laws that caused, um, in, in the Mishnah, we find these laws of postponements. And I'd like to look at one. It says, If Rosh Hashanah, which is new moon, happened to fall on Sabbath, the shofar was blown in the temple or in Jerusalem, but not in any other place in the land of Israel. And that's found in the Mishnah. And I'll, I'll, I'll just leave those references so you can look at them yourself. 
But that was found in the Mishnah. It says that the new moon, if it happened to fall on the Sabbath. So that shows that the new moon did not always fall on the Sabbath. It was something that could happen. It was an if. So then they would have a postponement based on that. And there, here's another one. Here it says, if the Day of Atonement coincides with the Sabbath, the loaves of the showbread in the temple are divided in the evening. If it coincided with the even of the Sabbath, that is Friday, the goat of the Day of Atonement is eaten in the evening. So that's also taken from the Mishnah, the fifth division under holy thing, uh, under Menohat. So we find that the Day of Atonement could fall on any day of the week. And this, the Mishnah, for just to let you know, the Mishnah came from 200 BC to 200 AD. That was the time period in which the Mishnah was written. And this tells us that this, the, the feast days, the annual feast days, floated through the week. They could happen any day of the week. And this was true from 200 BC to 200 AD for sure, because this is found in the Mishnah. Here's another one in the Mishnah. It says, where the Day of Atonement fell on a Friday, the showbread was then baked on a Thursday. So that's another um, postponement that proves that they were keeping a continual weekly cycle. Here's another. It says, where the Day of Atonement fell on a Friday, the showbread was then baked on a Thursday. I'm sorry, I just read that. Next one. It says, when the Day of Atonement fell upon a Friday or a Sunday. So here the Day of Atonement could fall on any day of the week. And the next one, it says, it says, the new year begins, I'm sorry, I did skip one. There's one more. It says, when the Day of Atonement fell, oh, <laughs> forgive me. I'm going to read this here. It says, The new year begins on Tishri 1, which may be the day of the Molad of Tishri, but is often delayed by one or two days for various reasons. Thus, in order to prevent the Day of Atonement, Tishri 10, from falling on a Friday or a Sunday, and the seventh day of Tabernacles, Tishri 21, from falling on a Saturday, the new year must avoid commencing on Sundays, Wednesdays, or Fridays. Now notice this. This is the, cu the current way that the Jews calculate the years. And this law that they use today, the way they reckon it today, was not used when the Mishnah was written. So this shows that the Mishnah was a very ancient document because this law was not in use at that time. Because at that time, the, the Day of Atonement could fall on Friday or Sunday. But today, it will never fall on Friday or Sunday because the way they reckon the years now, they... they prevent that from happening. So very anciently, it, the Day of Atonement could fall on any day of the week. Now, <coughs> now I would like to point out again that, I uh, read another statement from, this is the Mishnah again. It says, if the seventh day of the willow branch coincided with the Sabbath, the willow branch rite is for seven days. So there again, we find that the, the willow branch, the feast, could fall on any day of the week. Another one. On festivals, all priests, irrespective of division, came up for service in the temple and shared in the showbread. If the festival starts on a Sunday, the guest priests would have to arrive in Jerusalem on the Friday before, since travel on the Sabbath is forbidden. Similarly, if the festival closes on Friday, the priests would have to stay over the Sabbath in Jerusalem. Hence, in either case, they share equally in the showbread with the priests of the division in service in that particular week. If, however, the festival started on a Monday so that the guest priests might have arrived on Sunday but instead came on Friday already, or if the festival closed on Thursday so that the priests might have returned on Friday, but stayed in Jerusalem until Sunday, such delaying divisions or guest divisions were allotted only two loaves, whilst the remaining ten loaves were divided between the incoming and outgoing weekly divisions. That's in the Mishnah. Again, we find that these annual feasts, these annual Shabbaton days, could fall any day of the week. And this proves that they did not keep a lunar Sabbath calendar. This was not part of their reckoning. This was something, the Lunar Sabbath calendar idea was something that was invented 
m much later than all of these quotes were written. Now, let's read another one. It says, um, When the first of Adar, new moon, falls on a Sabbath, the portion, Shekilam, is to be read. If it falls on any other day, that portion must be read on the preceding Sabbath, and nothing additional is read in the following Sabbath. So, we find that these days can fall any day of the week. These annual Shabbaton days, these annual feasts, they could fall on any day of the week. And this has been in effect for many, many years. During the time of Christ, for sure, they were keeping the continual, unbroken seven-day cycle. Now, there was a Pentecost controversy. Some people don't even know about this Pentecost controversy, but there was a Pentecost controversy. It was between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And I'd like to notice a few things about this controversy. There was a controversy regarding what day that Pentecost should be kept. And I'd like to read a quote here from the Columbia Encyclopedia, article Sadducees. First of all, to tell you who the Sadducees were. The Sadducees were a sect of the Jews formed around the time of the Hasmonean Revolt in 200 B.C. Their sect was centered on the cult of the temple, and they ceased to exist after its destruction in AD 70. So you notice the Sadducees were in existence from 200 BC to 70 AD. That is when that time period of the Sadducees. And there was a debate going on about the Pentecost between the Sadducees and the Pharisees during Christ's time, where some were saying Pentecost should be s celebrated on one day and some another. And the reason for this confusion was because some interpreted the word Sabbath in Leviticus 23 differently than others. Now, look at the, um, this quote here. It says, Regarding the biblical commandment to offer the Omer, the wave sheaf, on the morrow after the Sabbath, the rabbis maintain that the Sabbath here means simply a day of rest and refers to Passover. The Sadducees, or Bethusians, disputed this interpretation, contending that the Sabbath meant Saturday. Accordingly, they would transfer the count of seven weeks from the morrow of the first Saturday in Passover so that Pentecost would always fall on Sunday. The Karaites accepted the Sadducees' view. I Ibn Ezra Adlock argues against the contention of the Karaites and claims that as all other holy days have fixed days in the month, it would be unreasonable to suppose that Pentecost depended on a certain day of the week. That comes from the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia article Pentecost. So here we find there was a contention between the Sadducees and the Pharisees over what day they should keep Pentecost because the Bible does not tell you what date the wave sheaf would, would be offered. It just says the day after the Sabbath. And the word Sabbath there is Shabbat. And since the 15th is not called a Shabbat, that it's very easy to understand why they, the Sadducees would say that it, this must be the Shabbat, the weekly Shabbat. And the fact that there was a contention at all proves that they were keeping a continually unbroken seven-day cycle during that time, during the time of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They had to have kept this seven-day continual cycle, or there would be no uh, controversy. Because if if the Sabbath all the time was the 15th of the month, then every time the wave sheaf would be offered on the 16th, and Pentecost would be 50 days from there, and would fall on a specific date. And I want you to notice that the date for Pentecost is never given. There's no date given for Pentecost. Instead, they were to take, uh, from the time of the wave sheaf, they were to count 50 days to Pentecost. There is never a date given, and that fact alone shows us that the day of Pentecost would float on the calendar. It would not always be on the same day of the month. And that is why um, this very contention over Pentecost proves that they were keeping the seven-day cycle, continuous seven-day cycle from creation. Now I'd like to read from another quote here. It says, the expression, the morrow after the Sabbath, in Leviticus 23.11, has sometimes been misunderstood as implying that the presentation of the so-called first sheaf was to be always made on the day following the weekly Sabbath of the Passover week. 
This view, adopted by the Bethusians and the Sadducees in the time of Christ, and by the Karaite Jews and certain modern interpreters, rests on a misinterpretation of the word Sabbath. That's Alfred Edersheim, the temple, its ministry and services. Now, whether it's a misinterpretation of the word Sabbath or not, I'll, I'll let you check that out for yourself. I believe that the word Sabbath is Shabbat, and it's referring to the weekly Sabbath. Now, here's another quote. The Sadducees offered the sheaf on the Sunday inside the Passover week, and while the Book of Jubilees held that the offering of the sheaf was celebrated on the first Sunday outside the Passover week, the Sadducees celebrated it on the Sunday inside the Passover week. And that comes from J.B. Sagel, The Hebrew Passover, pages 248 to 249. Now, I want to read another quote. We'll just continue reading quotes because there's so many of these on this uh, Pentecost controversy. It says, As to the feasts, the two parties differed in the manner of fixing the date of Pentecost. According to Leviticus 23, 11, and 15, seven full weeks had to be counted from the morrow after the Sabbath upon which the priests waved the sheaf of first fruits before the Lord. The Pharisees followed the traditional interpretation that the Sabbath meant the first day of the feast and that consequently Pentecost might fall on any day of the week. The Sadducees, or rather according to Shur, the Bethusians, a variety of the Sadducees, held that the Sabbath meant the weekly Sabbath and that therefore Pentecost always fell on the first day of the week. That came come from James Hastings' Dictionary of the Bible, page 351. So here we find that the, the Pharisees would keep Pentecost on any day of the week. Could it be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Pentecost would fall any day of the week. But the Sadducees always kept it on the first day of the week. It was always the day after the Sabbath, which the Bible actually says in Leviticus 23 that it w the Pentecost was to be the day after the Shabbat, which is always the first day of the week. So let's continue. There's another quote here. The Sadducees celebrated it on the 50th day which is inclusive reckoning, from the first Sunday after Passover, taking the Sabbath of Leviticus 23.15 to be the weekly Sabbath, their reckoning regulated the public observance so long as the temple stood, and the church is therefore justified in commemorating the first Christian Pentecost on a Sunday, Whit Sunday. The Pharisees, however, interpreted the Sabbath of Leviticus 23.15 as the festival of unleavened bread and their reckoning became normative in Judaism after A.D. 70, so that in the Jewish calendar, Pentecost now falls on various days of the week. That's from the New Bible Dictionary on the Feast of Pentecost. And another, another quote. This says, The date of the feast came to be firmly fixed only in later Judaism. It was now dated on the 50th day after the Passover. Opinions varied as to the significance of the day after the Sabbath, mentioned in Leviticus 23.15. The Bethusians, or Sadducees, took this literally and counted from the first regular Sabbath, Saturday, after the first day of the Passover, so that the Pentecost would always fall on a Sunday. The Pharisees, however, took the Sabbath of Leviticus 23.15 to mean the first day of the Passover, the 15th of Nisan, and thus counted seven full weeks from the 16th of Nisan, so that Pentecost would fall exactly on the 50th day after the 16th of Nisan. According to this reckoning, the day of the week on which Pentecost came would depend on the day of the week the Passover began. That's the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, the Jewish Feast of Pentecost. Now, I'd like to read another quote. Um, the Pharisees held that the time between... Oh, I'm sorry, I already read that. For, forgive me. Oh, it, it's missing from my notes. Um, the Pharisees held that the time between Easter, Passover, and Pentecost should be counted from the second day of the feast. The Sadducees insisted that it should commence with a literal Sabbath after the festive day. That's Alfred Edersheim, Sketches of the Jewish Social Life, page 220. So <coughs> what we find is there was a contention, a controversy over the Pentecost, what day they should keep it, and this controversy was raging from the time 200 B.C. to 70 A.D., during the time of the Sadducees. And this controversy could not possibly have existed if they were keeping a lunar Sabbath. It would Im be impossible for there to be a Pentecost controversy if 
Pentecost, if the wave sheaf was always on the 16th of the month, if Sabbath was always the 15th of the month, then there could possibly be no controversy over the day of Pentecost. The very fact that there was a controversy over Pentecost proves, without a shadow of a doubt, that they were keeping the continual seven-day cycle. They could not have kept the lunar Sabbath. Now, <coughs> the, f the Jews going to war on the eighth day of the month. This is interesting because if the eighth is always a Sabbath, we already have, have read um, accounts that the Jews would not go to war on the Sabbath. So if the eighth day of the month was a Sabbath, they wouldn't have gone to war on that day. But yet we find in, in Josephus that they did go to war on the eighth and the fifteenth days of the month. And I'm going to just quote one from Josephus. It says, Nor had the Romans succeeded in their endeavors had not Pompey taken notice of the seventh day, on which the Jews abstained from all sorts of work on a religious account, and raised his bank, but restrained his soldiers from fighting on those days, for the Jews only acted defensively on Sabbath days. So, so Josephus says the Jews only acted defensively on the Sabbath. Now notice this next quote. It says, from Josephus, But as for the Jews, when they saw the war approaching to their metropolis, they left the Feast of Tabernacles, and betook themselves to their arms, and taking courage greatly from their multitudes, went in a sudden and disorderly manner to the fight, with a great noise, and without any consideration, had of the rest of the seventh day. Although the Sabbath was the day to which they had the greatest regard, but that rage which made them forget the religious observation of the Sabbath made them too hard for their enemies in the fight. So that was Josephus' Wars of the Jews, Book 2, Chapter 19, Section 2. And I wanted to point that out because here, when Josephus gives an account of the Jews going to war on the Sabbath, he, he mentions that. He says, now this was the Sabbath. It was unusual for them to do this, but they forgot about it, and they, they um, went to war anyway on this day. So this was very odd for this to happen. Josephus says it didn't happen, but here was an exception. So whenever the Jews were going to war on a Sabbath day, Josephus would have noted that. That was his style of writing. He would have said, now this was the Sabbath. So notice what he says here about the eighth day of the month. Josephus says, So the Jews went on pursuing the Romans as far as Antipatris, after which, seeing they could not overtake them, they came back and took the engines and spoiled the dead bodies and gathered the prey together, which the Romans had left behind them, and came back running and singing in their metropolis while they had m themselves lost a few only, but had slain of the Romans five thousand and three hundred footmen and three hundred and eighty horsemen. So this pursuing of the Jews, and then he says, this defeat happened on the eighth day of the month Dias, which is Marchesphon, in the twelfth year of the reign of Nero. Josephus, Wars of the Jews, Book 2, Chapter 19, Section 9. So check this, check this out for yourself. Here he says that the Jews were pursuing after the Romans, and this happened on the eighth day of the month. If the eighth day the, was a Sabbath, then Josephus would have noted this. He would have said, and this was the Sabbath day. But no, there's no mention of it, and he just m mentions that they went to war on the eighth day of the month. The eighth day was just a common working day. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is very interesting. The Dead Sea Scrolls, um, the Mishmarat texts are the priestly service texts. They were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Mishmarat is a Hebrew term meaning watches, and is used in the instances as a reference to the 24 watches or courses of the Levit Levitical priesthood. So now let's read from this Mishmarat text. And here it says, On the first day in the week of Judea, which falls on the twelfth in it the seventh month. Now think about that for a moment. The first day in the week of Judea falls on the 12th in the seventh month. That means the Sabbath day would have been on the 11th on that particular month. And now here's another one. On the fifth day in the week of Immer, which falls on the 23rd in the 10th month. So here the fifth day of the week falls on the 23rd in the month. So that shows that the Sabbath would have been the 25th of that particular month. 
and this just shows f from the Dead Sea Scrolls that they were keeping a weekly cycle that caused the Sabbath to fall on any day of the month. Now I want to quote from some scientists and astronomers. There's many quotes from these who point out that the Sabbath has continued from creation. Okay, the first quote I'd like to read is, The division of time into weeks is a singular measure of time by periods of seven days that may be traced not only through the sacred history before the era of Moses, but in all ancient civilizations of every era, many of which could not possibly have derived their notion from Moses. Among the learned of Egypt, the Brahmins of India, by Arabs, by Assyrians, as may be gathered from their astronomers and priests, this division was recognized. Hesiod, in 900 BC, declares the seventh day is holy, and so also Homer and Callimachus. Even in the Saxon mythology, the division by weeks is prominent. Nay, even among the tribes of primitive worshippers in Africa, we are told that a peculiar feature of their religion is a weekly sacred day, the violation of which by labor will incur the wrath of their god. Traces of a similar division of time have been noticed among the Indians of the American continent, and now on what other theory are these facts explicable than upon the supposition of a divinely ordained Sabbath at the origin of the race? That's a track called the Christian Sabbath by the Presbyterian Board of Publication. Now, he mentions here that the, the seven-day cycle is in Africa and all these different countries. And I'd just like to give an account of something. I went to Ghana, Africa. And in Ghana, Africa, they have a custom where they name everybody, they give a name to everyone based on the day of the week which were, they were born. If they were born on Friday, they have a particular name. If they ever were born on Saturday, they have a particular name. I was born on Saturday. So when I was there, they called me Kwame. Everybody born on Saturday has the name Kwame. Now they also have other names that they're given, but everybody is given a name based on the day of the week that they were born. And they, they say that God, their, their God is called Kwame because they say he was Saturday born. Saturday is the day they honor their God, interestingly. But this is an ancient ritual. I, I was talking to several people in Ghana and doing some research, and this ritual of seven day of giving a name to, to the day, according to the day of the week they were born is very ancient, and it's a seven-day cycle the Ghanaians have of keeping their week. Okay, now let's read another quote. We'll just read many of these in a row now. One of the most striking collateral confirmations of the mosaic history of the creation is the general adoption of the division of time into weeks, which extends from the creation Christian states of Europe to the remote shores of Hindustan, and has equally prevailed among the Hebrews, Egyptians, Chinese, Greeks, Romans, and northern barbarians, nations, some of whom had little or no communication with others, and were not even known by name to the Hebrews. That's very interesting. Let's read another quote. That was, um, here's another quote. The week has been followed for thousands of years and therefore has been hallowed by immemorial use. Okay, and another one. I have always hesitated to suggest breaking the continuity of the week, which, without a doubt, is the most ancient scientific institution bequeathed to us by an antiquity. And now another one. It says, as to question one, I can only state that in connection with the proposed simplification of the calendar, we have had occasion to investigate the results of the works of specialists in chronology, and we have never found one of them that has ever had the slightest doubt the continuity of the weekly cycle since long before the Christian era. As to question number two, there has been no change in our calendar in past centuries that has affected in any way the cycle of the week. And now another one, it says, As far as I know, in the various changes of the calendar, there has been no change in the seven-day rota of the week, which has come down from very early times. And so, another quote, Some of these, the Jews and also many Christians, accept the week as of divine institution with which it is unlawful to tamper. 
Others without these scruples still feel that it is useful to maintain a time unit that, unlike all others, has proceeded in an absolutely invariable manner since what may be called the dawn of history. Another quote, the week of seven days has been in use ever since the days of the Mosaic Dispensation, and we have no reason for supposing that any irregularities have existed in the succession of weeks and their days from that time to the present. In spite of all of our dickerings with the calendar, it is patent that the human race never lost the septenary, seven-day sequence of weekdays, and that the Sabbath of these latter times comes down to us from Adam through the ages without a single lapse. And another one, it says, The continuity of the week has crossed the centuries and all known calendars still intact. Another one, It is a strange fact that even today there is a great deal of confusion concerning the question of so-called lost time. Alterations that have been made to the calendar in the past have left the impression that time has actually been lost. In point of fact, of course, these adjustments were made to bring the calendar into closer agreement with the natural solar year. Now, unfortunately, this supposed lost time is still being used to throw doubt upon the unbroken cycle of the seventh day, Sabbath, that God inaugurated at the creation. I am glad I can add the witness of my scientific training to the irrevocable nature of the weekly cycle. Having been time computer at Greenwich, England Observatory for many years, I can testify that all our days are in God's absolute control, relentlessly measured by the daily rotation of the earth on its axis. This daily period of rotation does not vary one thousandth part of a second in a thousand years. Also, the year is a very definite number of days. Consequently, it can be said that not a day has been lost since creation, and all the calendar changes notwithstanding, there has been no break in the weekly cycle. Another one, it says, The week is a period of seven days, having no reference whatever to the celestial motions, a circumstance to which it owes its unalterable uniformity. It has been employed from time immemorial in almost all eastern countries and is as it forms neither an aliquot part of the year nor the lunar month, those who reject the Mosaic recital will be at a loss, as Delambre remarks, to assign it to an origin having such semblance of possibility. And another one, it says, Nay, farther, the multitude of mankind itself have had a great inclination of a long time to follow our religious observances, for there is not any city of the Grecians, nor any of the barbarians, nor any nation whatsoever, whither our custom of resting on the seventh day hath not come. That was from Josephus. So here we find that the weekly cycle has not been broken. We have many, many accounts, many historians telling us that there has never been a break whatsoever in the weekly cycle. The changes, all the changes to the calendar had nothing to do with changing the weekly cycle. So the evidence is overwhelming, friends. I'd like to point out some of the things we have found from our look at history, some of the conclusions we can come to. Number one, counting the Sabbath by the moon is unreliable. This is just an observation that I've noticed. Counting the Sabbath by the moon is very unreliable. Um, just the other day, the half moon, which is supposed to be the most reliable indicator on October 18, 2007, was at 44%, and the following day it was 54%. But I could not tell the difference. I wouldn't have been able to tell you which day was supposed to be the eighth day of the month. And yet this is what's supposed to be used to tell you when the Sabbath is. And this is supposed to be the most accurate. The full moon can last for four days. It'll look like it's full for four days in a row. How do you know which day is supposed to be the Sabbath? If you're just looking at the moon, you're gonna, it's a very unreliable manner of doing it. If you're waiting for the new moon, seeing the new moon crescent is very difficult. The new moon crescent would ha it comes right at sundown. Right as the sun goes down, the new moon crescent is there and it goes down also. So there's only a brief time where you can see that new moon crescent. And another point on this, um, I, I once recently was talking to a friend of mine in California 
who keeps the Sabbath according to the moon. And he told me of a conversation he had with another friend of his in Florida who keeps the Sabbath according to the moon. And they were talking to one another and they found that they were keeping the Sabbath on a different day. One was said, Happy Sabbath. And the other said, what are, you, what are you talking about? Today's not the Sabbath. So th they were both observing the moon and came to a different day. Now think about this. The, the, the moon is unreliable to tell you. It can, I if we were to count the Sabbath by the moon, you could come within a, a few days of it, but it would be unlikely to catch the Sabbath day every month of every year. So another point here Sometimes the lapse between a half moon and a full moon and then a half moon is six days and sometimes it's eight days. It's a very unreliable manner to keep the Sabbath. And if you count the new moon by the visible crescent, then you'll have the half moon on day five or six of the month. And this is the way the Jews counted this, the new moon was by the visible crescent back at Christ time. And so this is not the way the Sabbath was ever counted. Let's go to the next conclusion that we can find. The historical evidence in favor of a lunar Sabbath is very unreliable. We noticed that when we looked at some of these quotes. We look at the context. We look at what they're saying. We find we can't trust these accounts. They're not reliable sources. For the same encyclopedias that uphold the idea that the, the moon, the Sabbath was originally connected to the moon, they also say that they do not know where the Sabbath came from and it probably came was adopted from pagans. Can't trust that source as reliable. Conclusion number three, the controversy over the day to keep Pentecost proves that the Sabbath could not have been connected to the lunar cycle. Okay, conclusion number four, there is no instruction anywhere in the Bible that we should keep the Sabbath by observing the moon. Instead, when teaching the Jews, God used manna to teach them. He never told them to look at the moon. Conclusion number five. There is abundant evidence that the planetary week has been in use for thousands of years and that the day of Saturn has always coincided with the weekly Sabbath. So th this is very strong evidence. Another one, conclusion number six. There have been several calendar changes in history, but none of them have affected the weekly cycle of the Jews. Conclusion number seven. All recorded changes to the Jewish calendar revolved around the Sabbath to guarantee its continuity. Now I want you to point out something on that. The Enoch calendar, we mentioned just a little bit, the Enoch calendar, which is also mentioned in the Book of Jubilees, is a 364-day calendar. And the, the reason for proposing that 364-day calendar was to cause the feast days to equal the days of the week, which proves that they did not keep a lunar calendar, a lunar-based Sabbath at that time. They had a lunar calendar, but they did not base the Sabbath on the lunar calendar. They based the Sabbath on a continual unbroken cycle. And the fact that they would change any changes to the Jewish calendar that have ever been done or even proposed have revolved around the Sabbath to keep the Sabbath intact. Today they determine the new year. The, their year starts based upon the Sabbath. So they never um, had a calendar that determined the Sabbath, but rather the Sabbath determined the calendar. That's conclusion number eight. And conclusion number nine, we see that the eight-day calendar of the Romans did not interfere with the continuity of the seven-day weekly cycle. The seven-day weekly cycle existed before the change and after the change that the, the Constantine did in 321 AD. It had nothing to do, it had no change whatsoever on the seven-day cycle. There are a multitude of witnesses that the weekly cycle was not determined by the moon and that the Jewish calendar dates can fall on any day of the week. These witnesses include the documents of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the writings of unbiased secular historians, and most importantly, the Bible itself. We have seen in the Bible that the Sabbath can fall on any day of the week. Now, conclusion number 11. 
every eyewitness account that I know of from anyone living during the time of Christ and the Apostles that gives us any clue regarding the timing of the weekly Sabbath in use at that time claim that it was equivalent to the day the pagans call the day of Saturn, Saturday. Conclusion number 12. The laws of postponements in the Mishnah during the lifetime of Christ prove that they were keeping a continually unbroken weekly cycle independent of the moon during Christ's lifetime. Conclusion number 13. There is no record of a controversy among the Jews over which day is the Sabbath. If there was a controversy over Constantine's change of the calendar in 321 AD, where is the record of a controversy over the supposed disruption of the weekly cycle? There are controversies with abundant evidence on many other subjects, but none revolving the Sabbath. Conclusion 14, the fact that the Jews held the Sabbath in higher regard than any of their festivals would guarantee that if such a controversy ever existed, it would have been the biggest doctrinal controversy in history. Yet there is no evidence that it ever existed. Now that is a very strong point from history. If there was a controversy over Constantine's change, which it has been claimed that there is a controversy when Constantine changed from the eight-day week to the seven-day week, if there was a big uproar, if that's when the, J the Jew Jewish Sabbath was changed from a lunar-based calendar to a continual weekly, unbroken weekly cycle, then there would have been an uproar. There would have been Jews who would refuse to keep this Constantine's day, s Sabbath day. They would have kept their own Sabbath continuing. If they had always kept it by the moon, they would continue keeping it by the moon. And today there would be a large group of Jews keeping it by the moon. And there would be uh, an abundance of evidence showing that there were two groups, some keeping it by the moon and some keeping it by the, the unbroken weekly cycle. But there's absolutely no evidence that any controversy ever existed. There was never a controversy over what day the Sabbath was. They knew what day the Sabbath was. If anybody lost track of the Sabbath from Adam's time to Noah, Noah would have had the right Sabbath. Because it says in the Bible that he waited seven days. He, he had a seven-day cycle in um, Noah's time because he sent the birds out at seven-day intervals. And then um, from Noah's time to Abraham, which is a short period, God would have showed Abraham the right day because the Bible says even that he would keep God's commandments, one of them being the Sabbath. And then the, from Abraham's time to Moses, if they had lost the Sabbath, which it is quite possible that many of them did during e their time in Egypt, when God brought them out of Egypt, he taught them the Sabbath, not by obser observing the moon, but by showing, giving a miracle every week with preserving the manna for an extra day. And if, so if they had lost it in Egypt, they definitely learned of the Sabbath when Christ was here, or when Moses, during Moses' time. And then from Moses to Ezra and Nehemiah, if they lost the Sabbath during that time when they went into Babylon, which it's unlikely that Daniel and his three friends had ever lost it. But if they got confused about the Sabbath when Ezra and Nehemiah had that great reform, that great revival, it revolved around the Sabbath, and surely they had the right Sabbath day. And if there was any confusion from Ezra and Nehemiah's time to Christ, surely Christ would have set them straight on the right Sabbath. But yet there's no record that there was ever a change in any of those periods of time. They always had the right Sabbath day. And it was always, if there's any question, reinstated, and it was still the same Sabbath from creation. So the, ti the Sabbath that Christ had at his time was the same Sabbath that God instituted in creation. It was a continual, unbroken seven-day cycle. And this is the same seven-day cycle that we still have today. It has never ceased. And it, it, God is under obligation to make us know what day the Sabbath is. And the Sabbath is still the seventh day of the week, Saturday. So we've had a huge amount of evidence from history to show the continual seven-day cycle and that it has never been connected in any way with the moon. And I pray that you will take this information into account. Check it all out for yourself. Don't take my word for it. I could have been misquoting. I put a, could have put dot, dot, dots I, uh, where there's some strong clue that would show that I'm telling you a lie or that this statement is not accurate. Check it all out for yourself. I encourage you to do that. 
I want you to do that. And not only with the quotes that I have given today, but anybody who brings up quotes in favor of a lunar Sabbath, check them out. Get to the bottom of it because you can't trust it unless you've done that. And most importantly, take the Bible as your final authority. The Bible has to be the final authority for everything. History will back up and coincide with the Bible, but the Bible is the final authority on this subject. Please take the time to study it out for yourself because surely if you are uh, privileged to live during the time of the Mark of the Beast, your salvation will depend upon this subject. So please check it out for yourself. Thank you so much for taking this time. I'd like to close with a word of prayer. So if you'll bow your heads with me or kneel where possible, we would appreciate that. Our dear Father in heaven, we come to you and we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you for giving us so many evidences in your word and in history that we can know what day the Sabbath is. We don't have to be in confusion. We can know that it is on the seventh day of the week, which today is called Saturday. We appreciate you giving us um, unquestionable proof of this fact. And now as we close, we pray that your spirit would direct our minds, that you would not allow Satan to take any of the words away from us, but that we would be able to take them to heart and that our, our love for you would grow stronger and we would receive a blessing from the Sabbath day for you only blessed one day. And if we miss that day, we're going to miss that blessing, and none of us want to miss that blessing. So we pray that you would direct us and teach us. Please add a blessing to the reading of everything that we have read so far, and bless us with your spirit continually, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.